Alrighty, I wanna share with you something that most moms are never going to brag about. You ready? Check out that sink. At this point, I don't even think I'd get anything else in it. And you know the most amazing part? I have a whole dishwasher filled with clean dishes that still need to be put away. My whole kitchen counter is filled with stuff that never got put away. And I even have a gross pot I get to wash out. My dining room table is surrounded by coats on chairs, people that left their plates and their bowls out. I have mail that I opened up and we even have rolls from yesterday's lunch. My window seat is absolutely covered right now in gloves, goggles, and ski masks. And in the living room here, you can see that I've got water bottles. This yellow bag here is actually filled with snacks and with silverware. Over there, people left their dishes out. I've got a blanket just thrown out. I come over here, here's more ski pants in a box. I have a laundry basket filled with ski clothes, more ski pants. I have a snowboard sitting out and yet more ski pants, along with the decoration that still needs to be put away for Christmas. So why did I share my extremely messy house with you right now? I'll tell you about that in a moment. This week, we're actually studying Exodus chapter 15 and chapter 16. And in these chapters, these come right after the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea. They had escaped from the Egyptians and um, they, are, they are just starting their journey in trusting God. And so in chapter 15, I want to read a one Bible verse to you. It's chapter 15, verse 1. And it says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. And spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his riders hath he thrown into the sea. So this whole chapter, chapter 15, is all about singing praises to God. Um, basically, the chapter starts off with a song that Moses starts singing unto the Lord. And that was this song here. All the way through verse 19 is his song. And then in verse 20, Miriam jumps in. It says, And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hands, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. And so not only are they singing, now they've got music, and they're dancing, and they're celebrating. But right at the very end of this chapter, verse 23, it says, and when they, meaning all the Israelites, and when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. And therefore, the name was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Well, you know, God just split the waters of the Red Sea. You walked over. You, God can do anything. So their first reaction when they get to this gross water obviously they're thirsty they're in a desert they're very thirsty but they get to this water and the first thing that they do is they complain and i don't know about you all but i don't like when my kids complain god handles it much better than i would have what god does is he just makes the water sweet it says and in verse 25 it says and he cried unto the lord and the Lord showed him a tree, which he hath cast into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And so basically at this point, Moses does what God says, throws a, a, like some kind of branch or something into the water, and the water becomes sweet. So everybody gets to drink it up. It's good, good water. Well, the murmuring doesn't really stop. This is going to be kind of the theme for about forever while the Israelites are in the desert. It says, um, when we get into chapter 16, verse 2, it says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And then in verse 3, it says, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So now they're really hungry because they don't have anything to eat. It's not to say that that's not legitimate. If you're hungry, of course you're hungry. You want something to eat. But the problem is rather than just going to God and saying, God, will you please give us something to eat? 
They just complained about it. It's like, oh my gosh, God, you brought us out of Egypt. We would have been better off to live there than to starve to death and die here. And so what does God do? God takes care of them. It says here, it says, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And then we get all the way down to verse 12. So God's giving them bread. He's giving them manna basically here. We get into verse 12. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. So now, not only are they complaining about that God gave them bread, now they're being picky. They're like, oh my gosh, you gave us bread, but we really wanted meat. Well, God is going to give them meat. And it says in verse 13, And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. So God heard their complaining rather than them saying, God, thank you so much for this bread. Can you please give me some meat? They complained about it. They didn't ask. And, but God is so faithful because he gave it to them anyways. And I just want to kind of share with you a final verse from this chapter. At the end in verse 32, it says, and Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. So the whole point of this is the Israelites don't really trust God right now. God is trying to make them trust him. And they're not doing a very good job of it because they're just complaining about everything. But God wants them to keep some with them at all times of this manna. Because eventually they're not going to necessarily have this manna at some point for them to eat every day. And it's like, keep, keep this manna because I want you to pass this on to your kids and to your grandkids and to their kids. Because I want you to remember that I did take care of you. And that's what God wants to, wants to tell them. He wants us all to trust him. Here's our Bible verse for the week. Psalm 31, 14. But I trust in you, O Lord, I say. You are my God. Trust God. That's all he wants you to do. And I want to share with you an area that I've recently had to really trust God. About a year ago, I had to have knee surgery. And it was a major, major surgery. I ripped the meniscus off of my knee, which is a, it's some kind of membrane that sits in that kneecap area. I ripped it out. And they had to go in and drill holes into my bone and my shin, and they had to actually reattach it. Now this surgery was a big deal. Um, I wasn't allowed to put any weight on my leg for six weeks. I wasn't allowed to bend it past a certain point for those six weeks. I had very limited things I could do with my leg. Then after those six weeks were up, I could start walking on my leg with it being straight only. I had a brace that went all around my leg and basically it made it so that I couldn't move my leg. Here's a picture of what the brace looks like that I had to wear. With that brace, I couldn't bend my leg at all and I can only walk uh, basically like a peg leg. My kids used to tease me and call me peg leg. Once I had that brace on there and I was able to start putting weight on it, six weeks later, I was allowed to bend it, but not all the way. I could only bend it to 60 degrees when I walked, which meant when I walked up and down steps, I couldn't actually bend my leg all the way to walk up steps normally. I had to take one step at a time. Um, but after that time was up, then I had no restrictions. So it took about three months or so before I, had, I was allowed to walk on it with no restrictions. To be able to walk on it with no restrictions though, I needed strength. And I lost a lot of that strength in my thigh muscle. And right where your thigh muscle goes into your knee is the weakest spot that I had because of that surgery. Well, we all experienced COVID-19 as well that spring. And so what happened to me because of COVID-19 is my therapy got canceled kind of towards the end. And that was actually really negative uh, in my recovery because without that therapy, my leg didn't get strong like it was supposed to. I didn't keep progressing. I lost four to six weeks of therapy time, and that means that because I didn't work on growing that muscle and getting it stronger, it got weaker and weaker and weaker. And so within six months of my surgery, I actually ended up, I still couldn't walk up and down the steps correctly, and that's not what's supposed to happen. 
I found out also that I have major arthritis under my kneecap. And so then I was beginning to experience quite a bit of pain from my kneecap sitting on my knee joint um, and just grinding every time I walked. So you would think most people after their surgery, they do their therapy, they start feeling better. Well, I was getting worse and worse and worse. And so I had two options. One option was I was gonna have to have a full knee replacement if I didn't get this figured out. And that's not something that somebody my age should, should do unless they absolutely have to. The other option was my surgeon told me, he said, look, I think you're past the point of physical therapy. What you need to do is hire a personal trainer and they can work with you and get your leg really strong. And if you can get that leg muscle strong again, the muscle will expand and it will push that kneecap off of your knee right where it inserts. Now that's expensive and I don't have a lot of money. And so I prayed about it and you know what? I just trusted God. I hired a personal trainer. Well, the whole goal that I had in hiring that personal trainer is I wanted to be able to go snowboarding. And so I started out not even being able to squat down even to sit into a chair. Like when you sit down in a chair, you sit down and both your legs bend and you sit down and then you use both your legs when you stand up out of that chair. I couldn't even do that at that point in June. I could only stand up on one leg and sit down with one leg because the other leg was too injured. It hurt too much to sit down and stand up because that put too much pain on that knee joint. Well, you wanna know something? I worked really, really hard I did everything my trainer said to do. I did stuff on other days that he recommended doing. I worked so hard. I went hiking all the time. He said, go hiking, go do hills. And you know, I love being outdoors, but man, when your knee hurts, walking up and down hills is not the most fun thing in the world to do. But I did it. I didn't complain. Well, maybe I complained a little, but I did it. And guess what? I went snowboarding for the first time right before Christmas. Now. My kids went snowboarding and they stayed out there for four to eight hours. I went out there and I was only out there for one to two hours because after the one to two hour mark, my knee starts to hurt. But you know what? God is good. I trusted God in all this. I trusted God with my money to be able to pay for those, pay for the therapy that I had to pay out of my pocket. And I trusted God that, that I was gonna be able to heal. I said, you know what, God, whatever happens, happens. I prayed, I begged God. I really wanted to be able to snowboard because my kids love it so much and it's something I like to do with them. But I said to God, I said, God, if I don't get to go snowboarding, it's okay. Just change my heart. Either heal me or change my heart. And God healed me. And I am so grateful. So if there's something that you really want, if there's something that you're really struggling with, I just want to encourage you. You should ask God. He's there. He listens. He cares. Ask him. He's good. He gives good gifts. He delivers us. Just like with the Israelites, he delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians. If you're struggling in a subject in school and you need some help, God is there. If you're struggling with a person, God is there. If you're struggling with just being unhappy, if, if you get new toys and you're just still not happy, ask God to make you happy. He cares, he wants you to live happy. He wants you to live a full life and he wants you to just trust him. Trust him to meet your needs and trust him and be thankful when he does and however he does that. So let's go on ahead and close in prayer. God, thank you so much for these sparks. Just thank you for the opportunities we have to trust you, God. I pray that as we seek you, Lord, that we don't complain. I pray that we just ask. And I pray that whatever your answer is, and that however you deliver that prayer, that we are just so thankful. God, I lift up each one of these kids and anything they're struggling with, and I pray that you hear them and that you meet their needs, Lord. We praise you, we love you, and we just want to trust you and be so thankful in that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.